Hello everyone, welcome to the CDV News on Calabash TV and on the Wave Radio 94.5. I am Lisa Joseph. Well, there's great public expectation as the Parliament convened Tuesday. It was the first sitting since the now infamous heated exchange between Speaker Peter Foster and Kashi Southeast MP Guy Joseph. In the aftermath of the epic session, the opposition MP demanded a public apology from the Speaker and from his utterances in the House came the trending hashtag, since when that's your role. Well, Tuesday, the House Speaker delivered, answering what is now the question of the year. However, Guy Joseph failed to witness it all in person, as he did not show for the sit-in. In, in a nearly 10-minute statement to the House, Peter Foster underscored the importance of the Parliament to the nation's democracy and governance emphasizing that the business of the House was serious and that his role is to maintain order as set out in the Standing Orders. Standing Order 41 provides that the Speaker in the House and Chairman of any committee shall be responsible for the observance of the rules of order in the House and committee respectively and their decision upon any point of order shall not be open to appeal and shall not be reviewed by the House except upon a substantive motion made after a notice. Standing Order, order 88 provides under the heading General Authority of the Speaker as follows. 1. The Speaker shall have the power to regulate the conduct of the business in all matters not provided for in these Standing Orders and 2. The decision in all cases for which these Standing Orders do not provide shall lie within the discretion of the Speaker and shall not be open to challenge. The rationale for these rules, which speak to the authority of the Speaker, is to allow for order in the House conducted by men and women of honour. That is why we are referred to as honourable members of the House. The Speaker reminded that there are clear guidelines for debate in the Parliament that dictate that members confine contributions to the subject of the motion. Members, he said, are not at liberty to speak to matters that are not relevant to the motion or bill, nor should they use their opportunity in debate to segue into attacks against other members or individuals outside of the Parliament. It is the role of the Speaker, therefore, to determine what is the relevance of the members' observations to the motion or bill. And that determination of relevance to the subject matter before the House by the Speaker is final and not subject to issue, argument, or objection. In order to observe the Speaker's authority in this Honorable House, when he is speaking or about to speak, and this is observed by the Speaker switching on his mic, all other members of the House are to remain silent. This is provided for in Standing Order 42, which provides whenever the Speaker or the Chairman rises during a debate, any member then speaking or offering to speak shall sit down and the House or Committee shall be silent so that the Speaker may be heard without interruption. The Speaker can therefore interrupt any member of the House during that member's speech in a debate. The House Speaker insisted that members must conduct themselves in a fit and proper manner during debate. And then came the apology. The standing orders of this House are designed to allow for vigorous debate and representation, but in an honorable manner, always measured by respect for each of us to the other. The authority is vested in the Speaker to enforce these rules, to maintain the honor and dignity that this House is to preserve. Recent events fell far short of these rules and my expectations, and I would dare say the expectations of the people of St. Lucia. To the people of St. Lucia, I apologize for allowing this to happen. I do not profess to be always right, however, whether I am right or not, no member has the right to argue with the Speaker or to behave in a manner that is not fit and proper. When this happens, there are sanctions that can be imposed, with which I am sure all members are well versed. Speaker of the House of Assembly, Peter Foster. Now, following the Speaker's statement, the business of the House proceeded with debate on the Economic Citizenship Program Bill. Prime Minister Dr. Kenny Anthony told the House that Senusha's economic options are very limited and as such, government has to explore all avenues. Dr. Anthony said his administration will be transparent with the processes, but because Senusha does not want to cause anxiety to its allies. 
the Prime Minister said the Parliament will have the ultimate oversight of the program, followed by the Cabinet of Ministers. A board will also be appointed to liaise with the Citizen Investment Unit that would be established for the management of that program. A Citizenship Investment Unit that is manned by well-trained personnel with relevant and appropriate technical and other resources to ensure that decisions on applications are rendered within 90 days. C, the CIU as a statutory body with the requisite operational autonomy to match the demands of the industry. D, the establishment of a specialized national development fund that targets priority investment and development objectives. E, legislative provisions for independent accounting and auditing of the fund and associated activities. F, provisions for the following approved and regulated constituents, a primary promoters, international marketing agents, processing agents, approved projects. G, approved processing agents that are locally based professionals with the requisite expertise and resources. H, a list of disqualified or excluded persons and nationalities and I, offices in key strategic locations to facilitate the program. Six, qualifying investment entry criteria and processing fees should be consistent and competitive with other Caribbean countries. Seven, government should also take immediate proactive action to improve St. Lucia's position in the ranking on the list of visa-free countries for its citizens. Eight, there must be an examination of how St. Lucia's current tax regime can facilitate the program. Nine, Parliament should receive annual reports on the operation of the program to include number of applications, number of applications approved, the operations of the proposed National Development Fund and related activities. Dr. Anthony said due diligence would be carried out to ensure that St. Lucia does not succumb to any pitfalls. The unit may engage the service of independent, professional and qualified persons or bodies as necessary to conduct due diligence checks on any applicant, and clause two, an applicant may also be required to attend an interview in St. Lucia or an embassy or high commissioner of St. Lucia prior to the consideration of his or her application for citizenship by the board. We are deliberately, Mr. Speaker, putting in all of those checks and balances to protect the integrity of the program and to announce to the whole world that we are different. We are different from the rest of our competitors. We are only interested in a program at the high end. That's the message we want to convey. Note, honorable members, clause 36, and in particular 36.2, that allows the board to notify the applicant and the minister in writing of a decision made regarding the application. But note that clause, subclause 3, provides for the denial of approval on grounds like provides false information, subclause 3AB, has been convicted of a criminal offense except where the offense is a minor traffic offense, is a subject of criminal investigation, is considered to be a potential national security risk, is involved in any activity likely to cause disrepute to St. Lucia, has been denied a visa to a country with which St. Lucia has visa-free travel and has not subsequently obtained a visa to that country, those persons, of course, shall not be approved for citizenship. While St. Lucia is facing a crowded field entering the citizenship by investment scheme at a late stage, the Prime Minister told the House that there has been tremendous interest globally since the announcement was made. And I can tell you from the number of invitations that have been issued to me and to others to come and speak about St. Lucia's investment program, we have declined all of these invitations so far because we believe that we need to settle our infrastructure and know where we are going first before any of those invitations are accepted. So the interest is exceedingly high. Um, the third, interestingly, Mr. Speaker, the third source of interest has already come from a lot of our um, investors in the hotel industry. And one may ask, well, what is their interest? Very simple. A lot of these investors in the hotel industry want to construct 
high-end bungalows and villas on their properties. Really high-end. Um, and they believe that if St. Lucia enters in such a program, it will give them a new point of entry into the global market. That if the high-end investment in their properties could be linked to the Sinjiba investment program, then there would be greater possibilities for them in attracting the kind of investment that they would wish. Of course, that was part of the wider philosophy behind our effort to enter into this program, because at the end of the day, what we need and need badly is investment. We are not going to pull St. Lucia out of its current cycle fully by simply engaging in internal adjustments to correct structural problems in our economy. Meanwhile, Castry Central MP Richard Frederick voiced concern about potential difficulties with the legislation. Mr. Frederick pointed out that the Alien Land Holding License Act may be something of a hindrance, contradicting the intent of the Economic Citizenship Program. On the one hand, a piece of legislation grants you economic citizenship if you meet certain criteria, but another piece of legislation says that for you to invoke your right under that piece of legislation, you need to get an alien and holding license. And that was not addressed in this piece of legislation at all. In what? He said 36. Clause 6? 36. Six. One second, Mr. Speaker. Let me just elucidate myself. 36.6. An applicant is, shall enjoy, no, 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 it says shall enjoy the rights of a citizen. No, I, I, I understand that. I understand that. But Mr. Speaker, what the legislation should have said is that once someone is invoking or makes an application under this act, then the, the requirements of the Alien Land Owning License Act do not apply. For all intents and purposes, for all intents and purposes, one is an alien until he becomes a citizen. Okay? Now, you are granted citizenship by investment as and when the property is bought. At that point. But the law also says you cannot buy the property unless you are a citizen. So there is an anomaly here, Mr. Speaker. There is a lacuna. You would become a citizen after you buy the property. But another piece of legislation says you cannot buy the property unless you have a license. So I think it is necessary that this piece of legislation stipulates an applicant under this act needs not apply for an alien land holding license. He went on to suggest the abolition of the Land Holding License Act, calling it archaic. And as far as I'm concerned, Mr. Speaker, all the, the applicant should be doing is to sign something, an affidavit. I so and so have never been convicted, I have blah, blah, blah. Have, you know, and as long as you can have a stipulation that once that information has been uh, investigated, and has found to be false, the property that you buy as a result of it would be confiscated. We could get the country moving. Let's get the country moving, and that is the intention of this piece of legislation. So when you have that act blocking this, you know, I don't know where we're going, Mr. Speaker. And the leader of the opposition for her part raised the question of whether economic citizens will be allowed to vote at general elections but substantively raised concern about the establishment of a national economic fund which would be financed by the spoils of the program. I heard in passing that the, the member for Viewport South suggests that in the spirit of transparency and accountability that there should be some detail attached to another section of the bill, but in this particular instance, I think it warrants similar attention and detail about the mechanics of this, and that more information should be made available at this time. Because it is critical and fundamental to the issues um, contained in here, and how perhaps the revenue generated from this activity can be best utilized 
for the benefit of all people in this country.